Let me introduce myself. My name is Clark Murdoch. I'm the director for the project on nuclear issues here. I have to say this is probably my last official duty as the director for the project on nuclear issues. In two weeks, uh, I will be succeeded by Rebecca Hersman, uh, who is recently retired from the Department of Defense as the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for countering weapons of mass destruction and will bring much needed enthusiasm and youth into the program again uh, during the time. But anyway, it's been a great privilege to serve as the director of Pony, and this is a fitting way to end it. Um, I would like to introduce uh, the two participants in this evening's debates. The Pony Debates the Issue has been one of our most successful programs for Pony uh, during that time. Matthew Kronick is an associate professor uh, <clears throat> at uh, Georgetown University, a senior fellow at the Atlantic Council. Uh, his bio and the number of things that he has written, uh, are the recent things that he has written are included in his bio, so I won't go over that uh, since you all have that. Uh, Ted Galen Carpenter is also a senior fellow for Defense and Foreign Policy Studies at the Cato Institute. We won't go over his publications because there's simply far too many to list, uh, to read through uh, uh, in this event during this time, but a prolific writer and producer of, uh, of analysis on these issues. Uh, and this debate will be uh, moderated by the project coordinator for Pony, Sarah Minot, uh, and she will explain the going in rules and then begin the debate. Great, thank you all for coming. Um, welcome to our debate. Uh, just as a note for the people watching on webcast, if you have questions, um, you can go ahead and email them to me at sminot at csis.org, and we'll be able to take questions from people that are watching um, on the live stream. So uh, everyone has the debate format uh, set up here. We're going to start with uh, opening statements, then move to cross-examinations. Um, we'll they'll kind of rebut each other's arguments from the opening statements, then we'll open it up to questions from the audience. Um, so without further ado, we can go ahead and get started with uh, Dr. Crane. Uh, well, thank you very much for that introduction, Sarah. It's a pleasure to be here at, at CSIS and Pony. Um, and I didn't realize this was going to be uh, Clark Murdoch's uh, last event, so it's, it's quite an honor to be uh, speaking here at Clark's last event, and, and indeed, you know, Clark's done a wonderful job with Pony over the past 12 years, so I think it might be appropriate to start by thanking Clark for, for his service. Um, he's done a wonderful job, so thank you. Uh, so the question uh, we're asked to debate tonight is if, or I guess the proposition is, quote, if Iran fails to make an agreement with the P5 plus one, immediate action should be taken against them. Uh, and I'm going to argue the affirmative. Uh, so first, what does it mean if Iran fails to make an agreement? Uh, well, I think it means that if Iran and the P5 plus one fail to come to a framework agreement by next week, by March 31st, uh, that would mean we've uh, failed to get an agreement. Or if we get a framework agreement by next week, by March 31st, but the P5 plus one and uh, Iran fail to work out a, a, a full agreement with all the technical details worked out by the end of June, uh, which is the second deadline, uh, if we fail to get that technical agreement by the end of June, then that would also mean uh, that diplomacy has failed. Uh, so why do I argue the affirmative? Well, I argue the affirmative for three reasons. Uh, first, uh, widely accepted, a nuclear-armed Iran is unacceptable. Uh, Bill Clinton has argued this, George W. Bush, and President Obama. And President Obama has been uh, especially clear about this. Uh, President Obama has said not only that our policy is not to contain a nuclear-armed Iran, but that it's not even possible. He said, it, quote, a nuclear-armed Iran is not a, a challenge that can be contained, end quote. Uh, so there's bipartisan consensus in favor of preventing Iran from acquiring nuclear weapons, bipartisan agreement in a policy of prevention. Uh, so the question is, is not, should we prevent Iran from acquiring nuclear weapons or not, but how best to do that? Uh, so the second point is that the, the status quo is also unacceptable. Uh, the status quo is untenable as the terms for a long-term agreement. Uh, after all, if, if the status quo were acceptable for a comprehensive deal, we could just declare the, the current situation to be a comprehensive deal and be done with it. Uh, but everyone agrees that the uh, current status quo is, is unacceptable. 
Uh, the best experts estimate that if Iran were to, if the Supreme Leader were to issue the order to build nuclear weapons, uh, that it would take uh, Iran roughly two to three months to get to the point of no return. Uh, so their nuclear weapons breakout time at present is two to three months, and that's too close for comfort. Uh, so the point of the negotiations over the past 16 months has been to roll Iran's nuclear capabilities back, to put enough limits on it, to extend that breakout time to a year or more. Uh, so uh, nobody, not uh, Republicans in Congress, not the administration, not the P5 plus one, not the international community, is prepared to live with an Iran two to three months uh, away from a nuclear breakout. Uh, so how do we get Iran to, uh, to roll back its program, to get this year breakout? So this leads to my third uh, point, is that if we fail to get a deal by March 31st or by June 30th, it will have shown that the current approach uh, has failed. Um, it will show that Iran was unwilling to accept this gift of a deal that we've been willing to give them. And the problem is not insufficient time. Uh, these negotiations are complicated, but not that complicated. We've had 16 months. Um, the problem is that the Supreme Leader is unwilling to make the concessions necessary to satisfy the international community that their uh, program can't be used to build nuclear weapons quickly. Uh, so we need a, a different approach if we fail this round to, to get Iran to agree to make these concessions. Uh, so one approach would be we could try to be nicer uh, to Iran, uh, but we know historically that Iran only makes uh, concessions when it's under pressure. Uh, and so uh, what it's going to take then if we fail this time is to bring more pressure to bear on Iran. And I think there are five things that we should do in particular if we fail uh, to get an agreement by March 31st or by the end of June. Uh, so first we need to make it clear that it was Iran and not the United States, not the P5 plus one, not the US Congress that was responsible for diplomacy's failure. Uh, we need to make it clear that we've been putting reasonable proposals forward for over 12 years, uh, which we have, and that Iran has simply been w unwilling to accept these reasonable proposals. Now, so far, uh, Iran's been better, I think, in the public diplomacy than we have. Uh, Prime Minister Zarif and others have been very clever in the way uh, they play the media to try to make it seem like they're the reasonable parties, and it's the international community that's being unreasonable. Uh, so the first thing we need to do is to work diplomatically and through public diplomacy channels to convince uh, publics around the world that indeed this is Iran's uh, responsibility, uh, not, not our responsibility. Uh, and this leads to the second point. The second thing we need to do is then shore up our international coalition against Iran. Uh, so steps we're going to take to put additional pressure on Iran, increase sanctions, uh, potentially tougher measures down the road will require uh, international support uh, from the P5 plus one and from the broader international community. Uh, so we need to work then diplomatically uh, to make sure the P5 plus one is, is on board still uh, with the negotiations, with our proposals for additional pressure, and make sure the broader international community is also uh, on board for the next steps. Uh, third, we need to increase the pressure on Iran through additional sanctions. Uh, as I've said before, Iran only makes concessions when its back is against the wall. Uh, the only reason President Rouhani was elected two years ago, the only reason we got an interim deal, uh, the only reason Iran has been at the negotiating table negotiating seriously for the past 16 months is because of the unprecedented level of international sanctions and international pressure we were able to bring to bear uh, over the past 12 years, but especially after 2012 on Iran's nuclear program. Uh, so we had their uh, economy on the verge of collapse. Uh, they signed up to this interim deal, and then we, we let them up. Uh, through the interim deal, we've been providing gradual sanctions relief. And so at this point, the Supreme Leader is not willing to make uh, the necessary concessions. Uh, so we need to return uh, to economic pressure, increase the economic pressure on Iran. Um, and President Obama himself has said, in, in his State of the Union address last year, he said that if Iran fails to accept a comprehensive deal, that he'll be the first one. President Obama said he would be the first one calling for additional sanctions. So again, if we fail to get an agreement, uh, then uh, the administration's stated policy is to call for, for more sanctions. So this should mean that the economic uh, relief that was provided as part of the joint plan of action, as part of this interim deal, uh, should be rescinded. Uh, this means that Congress should pass the Kirk Menendez legislation that would put additional uh, economic sanctions on Iran. Uh, and the administration to work, should work to implement these sanctions and to exercise extreme uh, discretion in using its waiver authority on these sanctions. Fourth, I, I think we need to take steps to increase the credibility of our military option. Uh, now, uh, some people, including in the administration, have argued that the alternative to uh, getting a deal now is war. And that's a little bit uh, misleading, because we have to understand uh, the asymmetric uh, stakes here when it comes to the possibility of a U.S. strike on Iran's key nuclear facilities. Uh, that's something we very much want to avoid, but it's something the Iranians want to avoid uh, even more. Uh, 
And so if we have that credible military option, if there's no doubt in the Iranians' mind that if they try to break out, it would lead to a strike, uh, Iran would likely be deterred from breaking out. And so that will uh, give us time then for this economic pressure to begin to work. Um, now, I think we need to be careful in how we do this. We don't want to rub Iran's face in it. Uh, the Iranians are a prideful uh, nation, uh, so we don't necessarily want to make these threats publicly, but we need to communicate privately uh, that there should be no doubt in their mind that if they're taking steps that we judge to be uh, them breaking out to build nuclear weapons, that U.S. strikes on their nuclear facilities will, will follow shortly thereafter. Uh, next, we need to communicate that this is our policy to our partners in the region. Uh, because one of the dangers here is that if our partners in the region doubt our resolve, that they might take action into their own hands. The Israelis might uh, conduct a strike, which wouldn't be in the U.S. interest, or other states in the region, Gulf states, might take steps to build their own nuclear weapons capabilities, potentially leading to a regional arms race, which also isn't in our interest. Uh, so we also need to communicate to our partners in the region that, uh, as we have been, but to continue to repeat the message that we're willing to do whatever it takes to stop Iran from building nuclear weapons, uh, including using force if necessary. Uh, finally, we need to let the pressure work its magic. Uh, with a credible military option in place, uh, with the increased pressure from international sanctions, uh, we need to uh, let the pressure work its magic and then be very clear to Iran that the door of diplomacy remains open. If they're ready to come back to the negotiating table, if they're finally willing to accept the concessions that would reassure all of us that they're not building nuclear weapons, that that door remains open. Uh, so in sum, the goal still here, rem uh, here still remains to be uh, getting a good deal that puts verifiable limits on Iran's nuclear program. Uh, we've been unable to get there through the current approach uh, if we fail to get a deal by March 31st or June 30th, and we need to try a different approach. Uh, so thank you very much for your uh, time. I look forward to the discussion and to your questions. Great. Thank you. Now we're going to move to opening remarks by Dr. Carpenter. Thank you very much. Uh, my thanks again to both Clark and Sarah, and again, my congratulations to Clark on a job very well done over the years. Excellent program. <clears throat> I think we need to face certain realities in our negotiations with Iran and overcome some persistent myths. First of all, I would argue that setting deadlines is decidedly unhelpful. Uh, I realize that failing to set deadlines can have its own problems. After all, we had the mutual and balanced force reduction negotiations uh, with the uh, Soviet Union during the Cold War that dragged on year after year after year without any uh, productive achievements. But setting deadlines, uh, I think, uh, entails its own problems and is generally counterproductive. If we are going to get an agreement with Iran, it is likely to take considerable time, far more than we have allowed to this point. A second myth that we need to overcome is the imminence of Iran becoming a nuclear weapons state. Uh, this has been a prediction that has been around a very, very long time. Uh, then CIA Director James Woolsey stated in 1993 that Iran would likely have a nuclear weapon within 10 years. Other predictions we have seen typically within five to 10 years, sometimes as little as three years. Uh, with Benjamin Netanyahu, Iran is always within a few months of a nuclear breakout. And one would think after hearing the cry of wolf that many times, we are justifiably skeptical about such predictions. We also need to face the unpleasant reality that there are only really two broad alternatives to continued negotiations. One of which Dr. Kroenig has already uh, mentioned, intensifying sanctions. But while previous rounds of sanctions have certainly inflicted pain on Iran's economy, it has not caused Tehran to capitulate on the central issue. And there is no evidence that a new round of sanctions would do so either. 
In fact, sanctions probably rank as the most overrated foreign policy tactic. The seminal work by Gary Huffbauer, Jeffrey Schott, and Kimberly Elliott some three decades ago, and the follow-on research, has demonstrated pretty conclusively that economic sanctions generally fail to ch achieve their objectives, and they especially fail to achieve their objectives when they're involving high priority policies by the target regime. There's no question sanctions can inflict pain on the population of a target country. The question is, can it get the regime to change its policy and change it in the direction we desire? And the track record is pretty, pretty miserable over a course of goody, a good many decades. We have to understand that developing a nuclear capability is a long-standing Iranian goal. Indeed, its roots go back to the era of the Shah. This is not just a plot by a handful of mullahs. The other option to continued negotiations is war, and I think we need to be blunt about that. It isn't enhancing the credibility of our military option, it is, in fact, resorting to the military option. Now, most hawks dance around that reality. Uh, there are a few who have um, provided refreshing examples of candor. Joshua Moravchek, for example, in his recent Washington Post article is quite candid about it, yes. If these negotiations fail, we ought to, in Senator John McCain's Nominal words, bomb, 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 Iran. But that would be a mistake on multiple fronts. As been noted by many experts, we probably can't eliminate all of the nuclear installations. So a bombing campaign would likely just delay Iran's ambitions. Indeed, I would argue that an attack would create a huge incentive for Iran to redouble its efforts and move toward actually deploying a nuclear arsenal, not just developing a nuclear capability. We have to acknowledge that Iran would be a larger and much tougher adversary than Iraq or Afghanistan, both of which have given the U.S. fits. It's both a larger region and a larger population. Moreover, yet another U.S.-led war against a Muslim country would validate the accusation that Washington is waging a crusade against Islam. That is a great recruiting tool for terrorists and other extremists. Beyond that, we need a decent relationship with Iran, beyond the nuclear issue, because of an assortment of other issues. Iran, whether we like it or not, is an important regional power. And indeed, it is now a de facto ally of the United States and the West, in the war against ISIS. U.S. officials and opinion leaders have difficulty setting priorities. We constantly want to accomplish everything. We want to destroy ISIS. We want to get rid of Bashar Assad. We want to eliminate Iran's influence all at once. I think we have to attain more reasonable objectives. The goal of getting Iran to return to nuclear virginity was unrealistic from the outset. What might be attainable? Verifiable limits on Iran's nuclear program with international inspections. But again, the devil is always in the details. And frankly, I am not optimistic on that score. I think that a more attainable goal is one of getting a commitment from Tehran not to build and deploy a nuclear arsenal. That Iran would remain one screwdriver's turn away from that point. Having that capability is not especially destabilizing. Deploying an arsenal would be. I think we need to focus on convincing Tehran that a deployment would be a bridge too far, that it would likely trigger a regional nuclear arms race, leaving Iran less rather than more secure than it is now. Now, we also need to have U.S. guarantee 
Iran has seen how the United States treats non-nuclear adversaries, such as Serbia, Iraq, and Libya. And Libya, I think, was an especially unfortunate precedent because Gaddafi, of course, gave up his nuclear program. And what was his reward for that? Support by the US and its allies to overthrow his regime. We need to convince the Iranian leaders that we are now out of the forcible regime change business. That would not be easy, but we must make that attempt. And as I will discuss in subsequent portions of the debate tonight, even the worst case scenario that if Iran builds and deploys an arsenal, that's a bad development, but it is not necessarily an intolerable event. And I think we need to make that distinction. Thank you. Great, now we're gonna move into the cross-examination. Uh, Dr. Kronig, if you would like to start. Go ahead, yeah. Well, thank you very much for those uh, comments, uh, Dr. Carpenter. Um, you said uh, many things, many of them I agree with, many of them I disagree with, uh, but nothing you said uh, called into question my conclusion. Uh, you didn't argue that we shouldn't increase pressure on Iran, and you didn't argue what an alternative course of action would be if we don't increase uh, pressure on Iran. So I think we can continue, to the, continue the discussion because it's interesting, but I don't see that a debate has, has formed here. Um, so we, First, we, we shared the goal. Uh, the goal is to um, make sure that Iran doesn't build nuclear weapons. I agree with that. Um, second, I, we need to make uh, clear to Iran that if they uh, do what we want them to do, that if they uh, agree to uh, a deal that rolls back their nuclear program, that convinces us that they can't use, build nuclear weapons, then um, we need to provide them assurances that we won't um, attack anyway. Uh, Thomas Schelling, the great deterrence theorist, argued that uh, deterrence uh, threats are always combined with a promise. Do what you don't want us to do and there will be uh, punishment. Do what you want us to do and there won't be punishment. Uh, so we agree there. Uh, to the degree that you had a proposal, it's an unworkable one. You said we should let Iran get one or two screwdrivers turns away from a nuclear weapon. Uh, but that's not a workable solution because once Iran gets one screwdriver's turn away from a nuclear weapon, what's going to stop them from turning the final screwdriver? Once we let them get to that point, uh, there's no reason why they wouldn't go ahead with it. We can't physically intervene to stop them. Uh, so the key then is to get Iran uh, to a point, even if we're prepared to let them have a nuclear capability, uh, to have enough breakout time to where if Iran were to cheat on that agreement, that the international community would have time to detect that violation, would have time to build political support uh, for taking action against Iran against, for that violation, and have time to use economic sanctions uh, first as a lever, and if all else fails as a last resort, military action. So that's where this 12-month breakout time came from. This wasn't uh, pulled out of the air. It was, uh, the, you can debate it, but it was basically assessed that that's how long it would take to respond to uh, any Iranian violations and, and stop them. So 12 months away is essentially, for all intents and purposes, the one screwdriver turn away. That's as close as we can let Iran get uh, before um, uh, uh, essentially uh, giving up the game. Uh, so the question then is how do we get Iran to, to roll back its program to get that 12-month breakout time? And that's uh, what I argued here. I laid out a strategy for how we can do that. And Dr. Carpenter made several interesting points, uh, but nothing he said um, uh, called into question or, or uh, what I've said or laid out an alternative strategy. I'll, I'll just comment on a few of the other uh, points, but, but that was the central one. Uh, first, he said that setting deadlines is unhelpful. You know, I think that's debatable, but the fact of the matter is we've already set a deadline. The P5 plus one in, already, P5 plus one in Iran have already set a deadline, so that's the reality we're living with. Uh, second, I think a deadline uh, is helpful in this case because, again, this two to three month breakout time that Iran has now is too close uh, for comfort. And so we're unwilling to live with this uh, as the permanent solution. Uh, it was always meant to be an interim solution. A permanent solution needs more breakout time. So we can't live with this forever. We have to set a deadline uh, as to when either we get a deal or we don't. Uh, next, Dr. Carpenter said that many people have been making outlandish predictions about how Iran was going to have nuclear weapons in two seconds for decades. Uh, I agree that that's true. Uh, many of these people just uh, didn't know what they were talking about. But the fact of the matter is now we have a very good idea of what Iran's nuclear capabilities are. We have inspectors on the ground. We have many of the best experts in government and outside of government doing technical analyses of how long would it take Iran to produce one bomb's worth of material, given what we know that they have now. And that number is two to three months. So this, maybe the numbers in the past were bad. This is a good number. Um, uh, he said that uh, resorting to the military option is, uh, is a bad option, and I don't think anybody disagrees with that. Uh, 
But the question is, if Iran dashes to a nuclear weapons capability, and it's the last resort, either we take military action or let Iran have nuclear weapons, which is worse? So it is a gut-wrenching decision. It's not easy. Uh, but the, uh, my assessment um, and that I've written about in, in my recent book and the assessment of, of the U.S. government is that a military strike would be less bad than living with a nuclear-armed Iran. Uh, that's why President Obama has been so clear that we'll do what we must, quote, do what we must uh, to prevent Iran from acquiring nuclear weapons, that the military option remains on the table to do that. Um, he said that we need a, a decent Iran, uh, a decent relationship with Iran, and we need to set priorities. I agree we need to set priorities, and I think everyone agrees that an Iran uh, with nuclear weapons is much more threatening um, than, than anything else Iran uh, might be doing. Is, is the cost of a nuclear-armed Iran outweigh any benefits we might get in terms of cooperation on ISIS? So I agree with the point on priorities. Uh, and priorities means stopping Iran from acquiring nuclear weapons, and uh, the other aspects take a back seat to that. Um, he said uh, getting nuclear virginity with Iran is not possible. I, I agree with that. That's kind of a false choice. Uh, we both agree that the uh, solution is to get uh, limits on Iran's nuclear program. And again, the question is how to best do that. I've said the way to do that is to increase pressure. I didn't hear an alternative from uh, my colleague. So I think I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Harpenter. I guess the fundamental disagreement I have with Dr. Kronig and with others who advocate military action as an option that must remain available is that a nuclear-armed Iran would be bad. A war to prevent that would be even worse. That would be inherently destabilizing to the Middle East. It would poison our relations with Iran probably for decades to come. And I have to admit, I experience a sense of deja vu with this, with people who argue that Iran is not containable, that for some reason deterrence doesn't work with Iran, that this is the great exception, the crazy Mullah's thesis, that if Iran had nuclear weapons, it would certainly threaten to use them and might well use them. If not on the United States, and I think most people, even in the hawkish camp, would acknowledge that it would be utter suicide for Iran to attack the United States, a country with several thousand nuclear weapons and a sophisticated delivery system. And there is no evidence that the clerical leadership is suicidal. In fact, there's plenty of evidence that, in fact, it is calculating and quite rational. Or the alternative argument that Iran would give nuclear weapons to terrorist organizations and attack U.S. allies in the Middle East, uh, primarily Israel. Again, I think those dangers are far-fetched at best. An attack on Israel would be almost as suicidal as an attack on the United States. The worst kept secret in international affairs is that Israel has a nuclear arsenal of 150 to 300 weapons. Again, Iran is not likely to undertake that kind of risk. What about giving nuclear weapons to terrorist organizations? Well, Consider the fact that Iran has had a rather extensive chemical weapons arsenal for decades, again, going back to the days of the Shah. It has also sponsored, worked with organizations that have used terrorist tactics, Hezbollah, of course, being at the top of the list. And yet there is a dearth of evidence that Iran has ever transferred chemical weapons to any of its clients, any of its non-state clients. If Iran was not willing to take that risk with regard to chemical weapons, why would it do so with regard to nuclear weapons when Iran would be at the top of a very short list of suspects if that client used such a weapon? I think, again, that is a false danger. Iran is, in my judgment, quite containable. Would we prefer to have Iran without a deployed nuclear arsenal? Absolutely. Could we live with an Iran that did have such an arsenal? I believe we can. 
And the distinction between the one screwdriver's turn away and actually deploying an arsenal is a very important one. And I think we need to look at what happened with India and Pakistan that reached that one screwdriver's turn away in the 1970s and yet did not deploy arsenals for another two decades until conditions changed and tensions rose. I'm not saying that Iran would forever forego deploying such an arsenal, but it doesn't mean that just because it developed a capability to build nuclear weapons, it would automatically move to the next step and deploy an arsenal. I mentioned the sense of deja vu. When I hear the hawks say that Iran cannot be contained, we cannot allow Iran to have nuclear weapons, I'm reminded of the same comments, eerily similar comments, about Maoist China in the 1960s and how the blood-curdling statements from Mao and his associates indicated that a Chinese communist government with nuclear weapons would be an utter disaster, that they could not be deterred, they would definitely use such weapons against either the United States or its allies. And the statements from Mao and his associates, I would argue, were far more frightening than anything we have heard from the clerical leadership in Iran. This was a leadership that actually argued that it was possible to fight and win a nuclear war with the United States, even if China lost as much as half of its population. Hawks in the United States proposed airstrikes against Chinese nuclear installations. And the Johnson administration, I know for a fact, seriously considered that option. Imagine what our relationship would be with China today if we had followed the advice of the hawks of that era. It's highly unpleasant to even contemplate that. And what happened when China did acquire a nuclear weapons capability? It actually acted in a more responsible manner, in part because its own insecurities were reduced. We can deter Iran, and given its importance in the region, we need to learn to live with an Iran, preferably one that doesn't deploy an arsenal, but even if it does, we need to learn to live with that reality, rather than trigger another war in the Muslim world, one with unpredictable but likely disastrous consequences. Thank you. Great, I think we're gonna get ready to open it up to Q&A from the audience. Um, we have a couple of people in the back who will bring around uh, microphones. Please state your name and where you're from and keep your questions brief. Sorry, they're just getting organized back there. I think right up here. Hello, my name is Hermes Levy, I'm from WS. My question is, uh, what, do you, what will be your comment about a third alternative, which would be trying to engineer inside Iran a friendly government? Uh, so the question was, what about a third alternative to try to engineer a more friendly government uh, to come to power in Iran, I, I think is the question. Uh, so I think that would be wonderful if we could get a, a new government in Iran that was more democratic, that respected the human rights of its own people, that was uh, willing to work with the international community, that was willing to abide by its international obligations. Um, and so the United States has had uh, some programs in place over the years to try to uh, support moderates in Iran. Um, I think the problem is there's really no evidence that a uh, major change in, in regime is going to happen internally within Iran anytime soon. Uh, and the basic problem is the, the clerics are willing to, the current regime is willing to kill to stay in power, and the opposition isn't willing to die to take power. Uh, and I think as long as, as that's the case, uh, we're not going to get a change in government. We were close, and, or we had at least a protest over the elections in 2009, uh, the Green Movement, but the government cracked down harshly, uh, put people in prison, exiled them, uh, and that really demoralized uh, this, this opposition movement. Uh, so a, a new government would be great, but I think for the time being, we have to work under the premise that we're going to be dealing with this government. I would argue that given uh, 
Washington's history with Iran, a, a U.S. blessing would be the kiss of death for any alternative movement. Um, I mean, going back to the CIA orchestrated coup in 1953, uh, the Iranians have long memories, and to be blunt, they don't really trust us and our protestations about democracy and human rights. Secondly, I think it's, it's a mistake uh, on two levels to see the clerical regime as a monolith. Uh, it's not. There are factions within the clerical regime. There are certainly reformers. And you know, even if you look at the, at the post of the presidency, there's a big difference between Rouhani and Ahmadinejad. Uh, that's reflected down the various levels of the regime. Secondly, the regime is now uh, about to enter its third generation. Uh, revolutionary intensity tends to fade with time. That's, that's almost a universal truth. And so I would be patient, let Iran work out its own internal political destiny without trying to orchestrate regime change. We haven't exactly had a great track record over the decades around the world with that strategy, and I wouldn't try it in this case. Uh, right up here. Just right here. Oh, in the tan shirt up here. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, Ebrahim Mohseni from University of Maryland. Uh, this is to Dr. Kronick. Um, as you went down your list of uh, measures, uh, you know, none of them sounded new in a sense that we tried all five of them simultaneously for 10 years, and all we got was a more expansive, more comprehensive, and uh, uh, a nuclear fuel cycle program on the Iranian side. They went from zero centrifuges to, uh, you know, to 20,000 now, and and uh, upward counting. So what makes you think that now things would be any different than they were for the past decade? Thank you. Well, I think the first point that I would make is that um, foreign policy is, is hard, and the Iranian nuclear challenge is hard, and so we have no good options. There, there are drawbacks to all the options. Uh, the, the question is, given where we are now, what is our, our best option to, to try to get a deal? And I think this is the, the best option to go back to the pressure track. Um, and I, I guess I would disagree a little bit with what you've said and what uh, Dr. Carpenter said. Is I think the pressure track uh, has been shown t to work in the past. If we look at when Iran's made major concessions before, it has been uh, under intense international pressure, whether it was in the Iran-Iraq war, uh, whether it was in 2003 when Iran voluntarily agreed to suspend its nuclear work because it feared it might be next after the invasion of Iraq. Uh, and if you look back uh, two years ago, I think the economic sanctions were critical to getting Iran to come to the negotiating table, uh, to striking the interim deal, and to, to sitting there and negotiating over the past 16 months. So uh, I think our only hope of, of getting an even better deal um, uh, than this interim deal, of getting a true comprehensive deal, is returning to the pressure track, uh, increasing uh, the economic pressure. Uh, because the, the economy, the Iranian economy, was under real stress in November 2013 when we, we struck this deal. We essentially had Iran on, on its back, and then we let them up. Mm -hmm. And so the, the bet I'm uh, hazarding, uh, trying to make here is that if we return to that pressure track, uh, they saw that uh, things were only going to get worse economically unless they were willing to make real concessions. That's our best hope of getting a deal. Now, maybe a deal is not possible. Maybe we are, at the end of the day, going to face this tougher uh, choice between acquiescing or taking action. But I think if we want to get a deal, I think that is everyone's goal. I think this is our best, uh, best path forward. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Clark Bordock. Um, let me ask a, another, uh, ask about another scenario. Um, recent reporting has indicated that what were P5 plus one negotiations with Iran are really U.S.-Iranian negotiations right now, uh, and that there are some who believe, the French are reported to be in that camp, believe that on major elements, the United States is moving closer to Iran's position uh, 
on several important regards in terms of trying to get a deal. What if we, instead of saying no deal, what if we get a bad deal? What do you do if we get a bad deal? I guess I would ask you first to define what is a bad deal in your view. One in which the breakout time, uh, we may say the breakout time is a year, but the experts say it's not really a year. It's not much different than what it was already. We have something that's been agreed to, but substantively looks very much like the current status quo in terms of a very small breakout time. I guess I would argue that even an imperfect deal would be better than no deal at all, and it's certainly better than the military scenario. So again, you know, is that a desirable outcome? No, not particularly. It's just better than the alternatives. So I do have, um, if, if I could uh, take a moment to respond also, I, I, I do have uh, concerns with uh, the direction the negotiations are headed in from some of the reports I'm getting back. Uh, because if we remember, the point of all of this going back 12 years was to get Iran to give up enrichment completely. Uh, that was the international community's position for uh, a decade or so. There were six UN Security Council resolutions requiring, uh, demanding that Iran suspend enrichment. Um, and then uh, we got the interim deal in which we promised that Iran would have some enrichment capability. Uh, and I think the Iranians had been pretty clever in kind of tying their own hands and making the case that they couldn't accept any deal that didn't allow at least some token enrichment capability. Uh, and convinced many people in Washington, including the administration, and so the administration began making the argument, we need to accept some enrichment capability in order to get a deal. So when they started to make that case, then I and I think others were prepared to accept some kind of token enrichment capability uh, to allow Iran to save face, but to get uh, a serious um, uh, breakout uh, time. Um, from the reports, it seems like we've gone well, way beyond that. According to the recent reports, we're going to allow Iran to keep something like 6,500 centrifuges, uh, which is way more than just this kind of token uh, capability. So I do have concerns about it. Uh, that said, if the P5 plus one, if uh, the Obama administration signs this deal, uh, it does seem to me like it's going to be uh, hard to, to undermine that, hard for Congress or anybody else to undermine it. Uh, there has been uh, support in Congress for uh, passing sanctions or, or for an up or down vote on any deal, whether it's a good deal or a bad deal. Um, and according to some of the vote counting, they're close to a veto-proof majority. But, you know, it's easy for Democrats now to say that they're opposed to a bad deal. When we actually have a deal, when it's being celebrated, when the administration says the alternative to this deal is war, I think some of those, um, especially Democrats, are going to waver. And I think it's going to be really hard to get a veto-proof majority against a deal. Uh, so it seems like, uh, uh, even if we strike a bad deal, that it's going to remain in place at least until the next presidential administration. And of course, uh, a new administration could decide to uh, take things in a different direction, could decide that, that uh, it doesn't think it's a good deal and try other approaches. Um, but um, if we get a deal, again, I think it's, it's hard to see it being undermined in the short term. Uh, right up here. Uh, Craig West, OSD. Um, so I'm curious for both of you to answer the question regarding proliferation. So if the Iranians were to get um, nuclear capability, even a rudimentary capability, the likelihood of other countries in the region going ahead and getting their own nuclear capability seem, you know, within the realm of possibility, particularly Saudi Arabia, possibly Turkey. So the question is, would the U.S. be willing to commit to attack Iran to prevent proliferation uh, and maintain some semblance of status quo under those circumstances. Uh, sure. Uh, uh, so Dr. Carpenter talked about some of the risks of a nuclear-armed Iran, and um, he said that deterrence can work, and he said that it's unlikely that Iran would transfer nuclear weapons to terrorists. And I think I agree with both of those assessments, but I still think that uh, a nuclear-armed Iran is, would pose a grave threat to international peace and security, uh, and that um, three presidential administrations have been correct to say that it's unacceptable, and that the Obama administration has been correct to say that we must do whatever it takes, include use force, to stop it, uh, because there are many other threats than the ones that he mentioned. And so the first, as you point out, is proliferation. 
I think it's very likely that other countries in the region would try to get nuclear weapons in, in response. Uh, Saudi Arabia uh, has already said whatever we allow Iran to get as part of a comprehensive deal, they're going to get the same capabilities. Uh, they've said if Iran gets nuclear weapons, they'll build nuclear weapons. In addition, I think Iran would likely transfer sensitive nuclear material and technology. I wrote a book on this issue called Exporting the Bomb, and I think Iran is a country that would be at risk of providing centrifuges, enrichment technology to other countries around the world. And all these things would weaken the nonproliferation regime more broadly. So I think there would be a, a major risk to, to the nonproliferation regime if Iran acquired nuclear weapons. Second, Iran would likely be more aggressive. Uh, we know that Iran restrains its foreign policy now because it fears that if it goes too far, it could invite a uh, military attack from the United States or Israel. But if it had nuclear weapons, it would have the ultimate security guarantee, and that could provide something of a shield for it to step up uh, its uh, support to terrorists, its course of diplomacy in the region. Iran explicitly says that its goal is to become the regional hegemon. And with nuclear weapons, I think it would take steps to achieve those goals, would lead to an even more, um, a less stable Middle East. Uh, so if you have a less stable Middle East with a nuclear-armed Iran, a nuclear-armed Israel, and nuclear-armed United States, for all intents and purposes, present in the region, in the future, potentially other nuclear-armed states, then I think there is a real risk of nuclear war. And I think deterrence would work in the sense that the Supreme Leader is not going to wake up one day and say, today's a good day for nuclear war. But I think there would be crises between these nuclear-armed states. And whenever you have high-stakes crises among nuclear-armed states, there's a risk of things spiraling out of control. Uh, so the United States got into these kind of crises with the Soviet Union during the Cold War. Uh, President Kennedy said the risk of nuclear war during uh, the Cuban Missile Crisis was between one-third and one-half. Uh, so looking back on the Cold War, I don't think that deterrence worked. I think we, we got lucky to some degree. Uh, and if Iran acquired nuclear weapons, I think there is a real risk that uh, nuclear weapons would be used. So for all of those reasons, a nuclear-armed Iran is unacceptable. For all of those reasons, the administration, the international community, should be willing to do whatever it takes to stop Iran from building nuclear weapons. I think that's a very important point. When you say that it's unacceptable, you must be prepared to take the ultimate action, and that is to go to war. Let's not mince words about that. And I think that is much too great a risk to take. With regard to proliferation, um, I think it's fair to say that the non-proliferation system has been slowly eroding for decades. We have not had the nightmarish predictions of the 1960s come true, namely that we would have several dozen nuclear weapon states by the turn of the century, namely the beginning of the 21st century. But we have seen erosion of the non-proliferation system. And I think that's likely to continue. Uh, whether or not Iran acquires a nuclear weapons capability, I think that is a trend that we're going to see gradually develop. Um, that being said, I think we should not be too hasty to say that a nuclear Iran would automatically lead to extensive proliferation in the Middle East. That certainly is a danger. Uh, I think we would likely see some of it. But I have backed away from an assertion that I made a, a couple of years ago that uh, such proliferation was a virtual certainty if Iran deployed an arsenal. It's a little more complex than that because governments make their decisions about whether to acquire a nuclear arsenal based on quite a number of variables, quite a number of factors. And certainly concern about a regional rival is at or near the top of the list, but it's not the only factor. Uh, elements of national pride, of prestige, of risk-benefit calculations, those all go into each of these decisions. Secondly, um, it is conventional wisdom that proliferation is automatically destabilizing. But as we know, that's a controversial position within the international relations field and has been for better than three decades, ever since the debate between Scott Sagan and Kenneth Waltz. Waltz made the argument, provocative as it was, that at least in some cases, proliferation can be stabilizing, not destabilizing. And I think it is interesting that I mentioned when China acquired a nuclear weapons capability, its behavior actually became more moderate, more constructive. India and Pakistan, I would argue, have been at least moderately more risk averse once they deployed their arsenals. So it's not a clear-cut case 
that proliferation is always destabilizing. The jury, I think, is still out on that. And again, it may depend on the totality of circumstances within a particular region. Uh, right up here. Hi, my name is Sanna Björling. I'm a Swedish uh, journalist. Um, I wonder if, if there is a deal and if Iran could come back to the table as a partner in the region, how big role could Iran play there? That is an excellent question, and especially given the, given the uh, Shiite-Sunni dynamics in the region, Iran being by far the leading Shiite power, uh, the United States and its allies having uh, more than a few difficulties with militant Sunni forces at the moment. Iran is a large, capable power and one that I think, if not, I don't think it's going to be the regional hegemon. I think there are too many competitors for it achieve, to achieve that status. But it may very well emerge as the first among equals in terms of Middle East powers, excepting Israel. I, I'm putting Israel in a separate category. But if you look at the other powers, Iran may be this, emerge eventually as the single strongest power. But that's still far short of being a regional hegemon. Uh, so this is a, a huge question that could be the subject of its, of its own debate and a little bit uh, further afield from the debate tonight, but I'll just uh, make a brief comment. Uh, I mean, I think it raises a bigger question about uh, America's uh, alliances and partnerships in the region. And I think the United States essentially has to choose between aligning itself uh, with, with uh, its traditional allies, uh, Israel and, and the Gulf partners, uh, there are problems with that, but that's uh, traditionally been the way we've done it, or aligning ourselves uh, with uh, Iran. And so there are some people in this town now arguing that we should switch, uh, that we should align ourselves uh, with, with Iran. Uh, and I, I, I guess I disagree with that, because I think in addition to the nuclear threat, which is a major challenge, uh, Iran has, has posed problems for the United States and for our allies in the region uh, for many years, and I think it's only been getting worse recently. Iran essentially controls uh, five uh, countries now, or has uh, un undue influence in five countries, uh, Iran, of course, uh, Iraq, Syria, uh, Lebanon, uh, Yemen. Uh, and so the United States has had a policy for decades of preventing any one country from, from dominating the region. And uh, so I think in addition to solving the nuclear uh, issue, the United States should uh, step up its uh, uh, pressure against Iran and try to counter this malign influence in the region. And um, uh, shore up our relationship with our traditional partners, Israel and, and the Gulf states. If I may just add on that, um, unfortunately, at least one of our traditional partners, Saudi Arabia, is about the sleaziest government one can possibly have. <laughs> and I might add, has probably done more than any other single country in the region to jeopardize American <clears throat> security and undermine legitimate American interests. If that's our partner, I don't want to have that partner. Uh, we'll go right here. Yeah, hi, I'm Laura Sarikoski, journalist from Finland. My question is for Mr. Kronik. Given the uh, unfortunate experiences of the United States in Iraq, how do you see the war or uh, strikes on Iran playing out on the long term? Yeah, thanks. Uh, so many people in international politics um, reason by analogy. Uh, you know, uh, when we're negotiating with a country, people talk about the lessons of Munich. When people talk about the use of force, they talk about uh, lessons of Vietnam or the lessons of Iraq. Uh, but often, reasoning from analogy gets you into to trouble because cases are so different. And so I think any conflict uh, w with Iran over the nuclear program would be very different from the conflicts in, in Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, uh, so first difference is, you know, one of the major failures of, of the war in Iraq was we had poor intelligence about the state of, of Iraq's nuclear program, so we went to war in a situation where we potentially could have avoided it. Uh, that's not a, a danger in the Iranian case. Uh, we have IA inspectors on the ground. They're visiting these nuclear facilities every day, <coughs> writing detailed reports every three months. Um, so we know that uh, Iran has an advanced nuclear capability. We know where these facilities are. We know how many centrifuges. We know how m uh, the stockpiles of low enriched uranium, and we have these estimates of if they were to dash, how long would it take them? Uh, 
So there would be no danger in this case that we'd be uh, going to war for no reason. Uh, we have a much better sense of what Iran's capabilities are and how close they are. Uh, second difference is part of the reason the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan were uh, so costly is because uh, the United States and international coalition went in, overthrew the governments, put hundreds of thousands of troops on the ground and stayed for 10 years. Nobody's talking about that kind of uh, a conflict with Iran. Uh, so, uh, you know, first of all, nobody's advocating we go to war uh, with Iran over its nuclear program. Now it would be as a last resort uh, if everything else failed in order to prevent them from building nuclear weapons. But at that point, uh, the options that would be considered would be uh, limited strikes on Iran's key nuclear facilities. So this would be done uh, through air power or, or strikes potentially from U.S. naval vessels at sea. Uh, we're not talking about boots on the ground. Uh, then Iran could potentially retaliate uh, but Iran uh, doesn't have impressive military capabilities, to be frank. It doesn't have a conventional army. It has these asymmetric options. It could hit back with ballistic missile strikes. It could sponsor terrorist attacks. It could cause problems in, in the Strait of Hormuz. Uh, but it's really hard to, to see, I think, a limited strike on Iran's key nuclear facilities becoming uh, some kind of large-scale large, large scale war. Um, so I've, I've written about this in, in detail. I have a, a book on uh, Iran's nuclear program about all the options, including the military options. So if you're interested in more detail, you can you can go there, but I think it's a mistake to uh, think about this in terms of uh, as something similar to the war in Iraq. It's about, it would be about airstrikes on Iran's key nuclear facilities and, and limited Iranian retaliation. If I might add, uh, I mean, we might want to keep a war limited. That doesn't mean that it would necessarily stay limited, and I think uh, Dr. Kroning is entirely too casual about the nature of an Iranian response and, in turn, the likely U.S. response. We start having American ships sunk or American troops killed or American planes shot down. I cannot imagine a rational debate in Washington taking place that emphasizes, well, we wanted to keep this very limited and we intend to continue doing so when the John McCain's and Tom Cotton's of the world start taking to the Senate floor and demanding escalation against this outlaw regime that has now killed Americans. If we set this in motion, there is no guarantee whatsoever that we can control the extent of a war with Iran. Uh, right over here. Thank you. Uh, Ross Harrison, Georgetown University. Um, we've talked about a good deal and a bad deal, uh, but we haven't talked about sort of what, if, if Iran accepts a good deal or accepts, or if Iran's willing to accept a good deal or is not willing to accept a good deal, sort of where does the fault lie here? Um, Iran's the question is, if the deal falls through, the assumption is that somehow Iran has acted in, in bad faith or that Iran has somehow failed to live up to the expectations of the international community. If you're looking at the deal from the perspective, from the Iranian perspective, is there a deal that makes sense for them? Assuming for a minute they're willing to accept the modalities that have already been laid out in terms of the number of centrifuges, in terms of the breakout capability, do we have enough on our end to deliver that is that they will that makes sense for them to be able to politically give up what they need to give up in order to sustain the kind of deal that um, is on the table? Thank you. Well, so I think the first step to answering that question is asking what does Iran want from the negotiations, and I think what Iran wants from the negotiations is a nuclear weapons capability and sanctions relief too, um, and uh, the problem is we're not. That's unacceptable to us. We're not willing to, to let Iran have nuclear weapons. And so we want reassurances that they can't build nuclear weapons. Uh, so that's, that's the problem that Iran is facing right now. They're not willing to take the steps to roll back their nuclear program uh, to, to reassure us. So it may be possible that there's just no overlap between what they're trying to achieve and what we're trying to achieve. Um, but if you take Iran's uh, cover story at face value that they just want a nuclear energy program, uh, then it's pretty clear that uh, Iran is at fault here. We've, uh, time and time again, over the past 12 years, given them a number of offers that would allow them to have a peaceful nuclear energy program and sanctions relief, bring them back into the international community, uh, and they've been unwilling to take the steps to prove that that's all that they're interested in. Uh, so if we fail to get a deal, uh, I think it's pretty clear that the, the fault 
uh, lies with Iran if you, if you believe their cover stories. Um, but as I pointed out in my opening remarks, I think we need to do a better job in diplomacy and in public diplomacy of making that clear because I think the Iranians have been a little bit better in their public diplomacy and have confused that narrative a little bit. It was an excellent question. Um, and I've always w wondered, even if the Iranians gave us everything we were seeking in an agreement, could we actually deliver our end? Because certainly one of the things Iran wants is not just sanctions relief, not just a partial lifting of sanctions. They want a comprehensive lifting of sanctions. And much of that requires congressional action. I have substantial doubts whether this Congress especially would approve the measures necessary to lift sanctions in a comprehensive way. And if, if it so happened that we got a desirable agreement and then in essence we double-crossed the Iranians and kept the sanctions in place, um, I think that would have a tremendous potential to poison relations over the long term. And again, the United States unfortunately has a nasty habit of reneging on promises. One of the things we did in, on the Korean Peninsula throughout the uh, Cold War, especially the latter stages, was promise cross-recognition of the North Korean and South Korean regime. If uh, Moscow and Beijing would recognize South Korea, we would in turn recognize North Korea. Well, of course, Moscow and Beijing did recognize South Korea, and the United States found ample reasons not to recognize North Korea. I suspect the Iranians uh, believe that we would pull a similar bait and switch with regard to any agreement that they reach here, and that, that is a, a major impediment. All right, I think we have time for one more question right in the back. I'm for the Abu ISS. Um, just to continue the point that Dr. Carpenter was making, um, so there is actually a, a state that has a nuclear bomb which is effectively ostracized, and that is the state of North Korea. Um, and something tells me that Iran would be unwilling to take that bargain. So the question is, um, how realistic would it be, in your opinion, to cite the North Korean experience or North Korean case to deter Iran's nuclear capabilities? Well, I think that's an argument that uh, the administration in the P5 plus one has tried to make, that uh, uh, pursuing nuclear weapons will make Iran uh, less secure, not more secure, uh, that uh, it will uh, make it ostracized from the international community. Um, and so uh, I think that's an important argument to make. I think it becomes harder if we uh, get a, a so-called bad deal, and the international community essentially blesses uh, Iran, uh, that is a screwdriver's turn away from a nuclear weapon, as, as Dr. Carpenter uh, put it. The, the difference with North Korea is that we were never willing to accept, the international community was never willing to accept Iran's, or North Korea's nuclear capability. Uh, all the agreements we've been negotiating were for complete and irreversible nuclear dismantlement uh, in North Korea. And so we've already given uh, Iran more ground there. And if we get a so-called bad deal that blesses Iran's nuclear capability, then I think it's harder to uh, replicate the kind of model with North Korea uh, uh, in Iran. Okay, great. We can move on to closing arguments. Dr. Koenig, if you want to start. Great. So in our uh, discussion and in the Q&A section, we got into a wide-ranging discussion about all kinds of things, about North Korea, about uh, Iran's role in the region, about possible military options. But I just want to remind everyone uh, what, the discussion, uh, what the discussion topic was today, which is if we don't get a deal by next week, or if we get a deal next week, but we don't work out all the technical agreements by uh, June 30th, should the P5 plus one uh, and the United States take additional action against Iran? And my argument was uh, that we should, that we should take a number of steps uh, to increase the pressure on Iran, that that's our only hope of getting a good deal. Uh, so I reminded uh, everyone that a nuclear-armed Iran is unacceptable. That's been a consistent uh, position of the United States for three presidential administrations. Um, that the, the status quo is also untenable, that Iran is too close for comfort. We need to get uh, role of Iran's, nu Iran's nuclear capabilities back. Again, there's bipartisan consensus on that. Uh, and the key to doing that is to bringing more pressure to bear. So we need to make clear that Iran uh, is at fault for diplomacy's failure, uh, 
strengthen our international coalition, make sure the international support is in place. Three, increase pressure on Iran through increased sanctions. Uh, four, increase the credibility of the military threat through private channels. And then five, uh, keep the door open uh, for a good deal if Iran is willing to come back and make additional concessions. Um, my colleague uh, didn't really offer a counter to that. Uh, he raised a number of interesting points, but never articulated what an alternative would be. And to the degree that he did, he essentially, as I heard it, argued that we should give up and allow Iran to have nuclear weapons. Uh, he argued that we should let Iran be one screwdriver turn away uh, from a nuclear capability. Uh, but at that point, we wouldn't be able to physically stop Iran. There would be nothing to physically stop Iran uh, from building nuclear weapons. It would likely go ahead and build nuclear weapons. Uh, Dr. Carpenter argued, well, for some time they might stop. Um, India and Pakistan remain non-nuclear for a while, but eventually they went nuclear, and Iran might eventually go nuclear, but that we can live with it. Uh, so his argument, uh, to the degree I heard it again, was to let Iran go nuclear and that we can live with that. Um, but the argument that we can live with a nuclear on Iran is outside of the, the mainstream. Uh, nobody in positions of power uh, in the United States, not the Republicans in Congress, not the administration, believe that a nuclear armed Iran is acceptable. Uh, the bipartisan consensus is that we have a policy of prevention, and the real question is how to do that. And as I have articulated, uh, if we fail to get a deal, uh, our best hope of doing that is by increasing pressure. So, thank you. I guess I would argue that uh, bipartisan agreement is at least one sign of folly we, we've had a, a bad history of bipartisan consensus that proved to be disastrously wrong. And again, to bring back the, the comparison with China, the idea of tolerating a nuclear-armed China was considered absolutely unacceptable to both political parties in the 1960s, utterly unacceptable. And to a large extent, having a meaningful relationship with a communist China was considered utterly unacceptable. And then, voila, Richard Nixon managed to change the parameters of that debate, and we have developed an extremely constructive relationship, not one without complication, certainly, but on balance, a very constructive relationship over the decades. I have a similar hope with Iran. Often in international affairs, the choice is not between a good option and a bad option, it may be between a bad option and a worse one. And I think that's what we face here. Is it desirable to deal with Iran that could break out and become a nuclear weapon state? Or even worse, an Iran that is already a nuclear weapon state? No, clearly that's not a desirable outcome. That's a bad outcome. But a worse outcome is pretending that economic sanctions will achieve what it has singularly been unable to achieve over a period of many, many years, or we resort to war, another war, against a Muslim country, which would validate every narrative of the extremists that we are waging a war against Islam, a war that would destabilize the region to an even greater extent than it has been and would have unpredictable but almost certainly disastrous consequences. That is a worse option. I would also like to touch on a point that we, we barely discussed tonight, and I think it's an important one, uh, the P-5-1 negotiations. Uh, do we have an international consensus about what to do with Iran if the current set of negotiations fails to produce a desirable result? I have my doubts about that on, on multiple levels. For one thing, some of the European powers appear to have gone along with the sanctions approach, primarily because they have been afraid that otherwise the United States would do something really reckless. So how reliable is their support for a stronger stance against Iran? I think that is at least very much an open question. Secondly, uh, one of the powers, Russia, we have seen a rather serious deterioration in relations between that country and the United States and its allies. Russia, I'm sure, would prefer to see Iran remain non-nuclear. 
But how much diplomatic and political capital is Vladimir Putin willing to spend to support what is primarily a policy of the United States and its closest allies? Again, I think there are very serious questions about that, given the current context of Russian-Western relations. We may find that we think we have an international coalition, an international consensus, to support our hard line policy against Iran, and we may well discover that that is largely an illusion. I will close with that. We obviously have a complex topic here. And again, I would return to the argument, often the choice is between a bad option and an even worse one. I'm afraid the Hawks want to embrace the worst possible option. And on that, would you all please join me in thanking Dr. Carpenter and Dr. Kronig for participating.